we have of the leadership of the church and the administration of the church to welcome each of you to another session of the Dyer Baptist Bible Institute. I'm glad that you're here. I did give out some verses to those who are here a little bit early. Please have your verse ready. I don't know who got what verse, all right? So I don't know who you are. But please listen for the reference on your little piece of paper. And uh, when you hear the reference called, just uh, go ahead and read in a good, strong voice if you would, okay? So I don't know who you are. I don't remember who got what reference. So when I call the reference, please just be prepared to uh, read it. This is our first Sunday back after COVID-19. Been different, hasn't it? Yes. My, it's been different. And so, of necessity, we need to have at least some review. And I'll try not to be pedantic and uh, overdo it with review, but I can't even remember what happened four hours ago when I first got up, let alone what I said four months ago. So will you humor me and will you let me review with me, okay? I'm reviewing for me and I hope it will also be helpful to the rest of you. The verb divide means to cause to be separate. You drive a wedge, you drive a wedge and you force or cause to be separate. You uh, drive a wedge and you separate into opposing sides or parties. The noun divide refers to an act, an act of dividing, like a dividing ridge between drainage areas. You've heard of the Great Divide or the Continental Divide. In America, uh, North America comes down through uh, um, Alberta, the uh, Canadian Rockies on down in the United States, the American Rockies, and it goes right on down uh, into South America. So we call it the continental split or division. You ever heard of churches splitting? Yes. Well, unfortunately, uh, churches divide sometimes because of uh, non-essential things. Other times, churches divide over essential doctrine. And one of the purposes of this course is to try to teach us the difference between uh, a division that is biblically necessary, things that we need to divide over. Certainly, we would need to divide over a doctrine like the virgin birth, would we not? I would never attend a church that does not have the virgin birth in its doctrinal statement. I would never have an evangelistic meeting and invite someone to come and sit on the platform and lead in prayer just because maybe his church members will come if he's going to be there. I'd never invite him to come and, and take part in the service if he didn't believe in the virgin birth. There are some biblical and necessary divisions, but then unfortunately, sometimes some churches divide over things that are non-essential. The Bible says in Amos 3, 3, can two, can two walk together except they be agreed? Uh, Jane and I walk around the pond where we live now and we like to look at the, the, the fountains and the swans, but we need to walk somewhat in step or because of my longer span, I'm gonna get way ahead of her. Imagine if I got halfway around the pond halfway around the pond while she was basically just getting started. You wouldn't call that walking together, would you? You wouldn't call that walking in step. Uh, can two walk together except they be agreed? In uh, Ezekiel 22, 26, God laments, he laments that Israel's priests, Israel's priests have put, put no difference, they put no difference or no division between the unclean and the clean. 
And God says there should be a separation. There should be a division between the unclean and the clean. And God says when you don't put a separation or division between what is unclean and what is clean, God says I am profaned among and by my priests because they don't know what to divide over. They don't know what to put a difference between. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 17 reads, What fellowship, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? How can they get along? It's like water and oil. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, divide, saith the Lord. Now, we think of our Lord being prophetically called the Prince of Peace. And we often sing about that at Christmas. But uh, he himself said, I've not come to bring peace but a sword. And he talks about the fact, and this is very sad, I don't like it. May I make it very plain? I don't like divisions. Oh my. Uh, divisions just tear the innards out of the pastor. And Jesus wants to bring peace. But when people resist him, he brings division. He said, in some cases, I will even divide families. He said, I'll, I'll separate parents from children and siblings from each other. That's what the Prince of Peace said. But we know that the Battle of Armageddon is coming because people hate Jesus. And the Battle of Armageddon is going to be a mighty big division, a separating. So Jesus wants to be the Prince of Peace. I want to be a peaceful preacher, but some issues require us to divide. All right, so over here, over here, theological divides. We're going to be studying in the course of this class, theological divide. There's the continental divide. It's a division. We have it in nature. It, it's bound to be in the spiritual realm because it exists in nature. If all the rivers ran to the Atlantic, there'd be a problem. If all the rivers ran to the Pacific, there'd be a problem. So God ordained a continental divide. And there must be division spiritually, even though they break our hearts. We're looking at the division between Calvinism or Arminianism. And by the way, you don't have to, you don't have to keep a nasty spirit when you divide. I don't hate Calvinists. I don't hate them at all. Um, I love them. But, but I, I'm, I'm not going to be a member of a church that teaches five-point Calvinism. Uh, nor am I against everything they do. But I'm just not going to link up Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday after Wednesday with, with doctrine that I feel is contrary to the Bible. So in the beginning of this course, we're looking at the division between the Calvinists and Arminians. We'll study covenant theology or dispensational theology. They're very different. They're very different. And one of the key differences is that the covenant theologians basically no longer have a place for Israel. And I can't agree with that. That is unscriptural. We are dispensationalists. We believe that God is not finished with the nation of Israel. And it seems to me if you read the, news, the newspaper or listen to the evening news, you can tell that God still has, a, he still has a role and a place for Israel. So these are serious, serious things. Uh, covenant theology says uh, God, is, God is done with Israel. He is done with the Jews. He relegated them to the trash heap of history because they rejected Jesus the first time. And it's all the church now. It's all the church. The church replaced Israel, and Israel will never be back. I do not believe that. And the doctrinal statement of the Dyer Baptist Church does not agree with uh, covenant theology and saying that God is all done with Israel. We'll look at replacement theology, and I've already uh, alluded to it, replacement theology says uh, God has replaced Israel with the church. Forget about Israel. Uh, she's done as an entity. God's only work left is with the church. Then we'll also look at glossolalia. Glossolalia. I can hardly say it. And, and, and I say that because 
glossolalia has to do with your tongue and your mouth. Glossolalia is what most people call tongues, and it's okay if you call it tongues. Languages, um, especially as it relates to what some people call an ecstatic, an ecstatic utterance. Um, a lady tried to teach me one time to talk in tongues, and that was quite an experience. And I was, I was not raised in a Baptist environment, and but when I saw her, how she tried to, how she tried to cite me, and that's exactly what she was doing. She was trying to cite me into glossolalia, uh, the ecstatic worship utterance, when uh, it's not a human earthly language. We believe that the tongues in the book of Acts were real, actual, earthly languages because the first few chapters make it plain that Jews had come back from all over the known world. Jews had come back for the Feast of Pentecost, and the people said, we do hear them all speak in our tongues. They scattered throughout the known world. They all had different dialects, and some of them went uh, for business to North Africa and uh, Italy and other places, uh, and some of them were second generation, and they'd been reared with different languages, and they got back home for the Feast of Pentecost, and God miraculously allowed Peter and the other apostles to, to preach in a real earthly language or dialect that they had not studied in college. That was the miracle, but it was real, actual earthly language, not an ecstatic utterance that you can psych yourself up to. I was told to say one little phrase, Alamagama, Alamagama, Alamagama. Just say it, David, now. I was at the front kneeling in a camp meeting. Alamagama, David, just say it. Let yourself go. Let yourself go. Hey, when you let yourself go, you better be careful what's coming in. You know, we got this big emphasis today. Just empty yourself and, and uh, med meditate and let yourself go. Go up on a high mountain in Colorado uh, with Shirley McLean and uh, uh, meditate, empty yourself, and be filled with the force. I'd be careful what force I was going to be filled with. So we'll talk about this ecstatic, uh, meditative, let yourself go, so-called worship language. And uh, then we'll talk about why music why music divides believers. I, uh, I went to get our car, to vacuum our car uh, yesterday at a, a car wash place, and I'll try not to name it. I'll try not to name it. And there are, there are at least six signs. No loud music. No loud music. The signs are on the building, and the signs are out where the vacuums are. No loud music. And uh, I was there a few days ago, no loud music. The music was awful, I, I could hardly think. And I'm looking for the car, I'm looking for the car. And then the place nearly emptied out. And there was only one car left. And, and uh, the music wasn't coming from the one car. And it sure wasn't coming from my car. It was coming from the speakers in the wall of the building that owned and administrated the car. It was coming from their own speakers. They had a change in management maybe six months ago. No, no, Jane doesn't know it yet, but we're going to sneak over there with my video camera, and I'm going to go <laughs> right under one of those speakers. I'm going to shoot the signs first, no loud music, and my camera will pick up this horrendously loud music, and uh, I'm going to put that up in Facebook as a little bit of little bit of irony. You see, people hate rules and they hate laws. No loud music and right beside the speaker, you know, wah, 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 wah. Yes, sir. Just, uh, you know, uh, experience I had just the other day, I went to uh, True Value Hardware in Crown Point yes. to pick up something. And uh, I was trying to concentrate on a part that I needed for the, the trailer we used for the long one. Yes. But, uh, uh, and a tool, uh, but, uh, just the, the music that they had, it just, you know, I, I grew up on pretty bad music, and so I just, it was just literally grieving me to have to sit there and listen to it, uh, and uh, I just, uh, anyway, just, it's, it, there's a battle going on. There is. Um, there is a form of therapy, I'm not going to argue pro or con, but there is a, a form of therapy. Some people get a degree in it music therapy. Uh, some Christians, some Christians get a degree in music therapy and they go into hospitals, usually with just a rhythm guitar or maybe a little harp, 
and, and they sing songs to people who have Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, they sing. And uh, music makes a difference. Music made a difference to King Saul, did it not? Yes. What well, he was all agitated. Boy, I was agitated before I got out of that car wash. <laughs> yeah, I was just so agitated. Now, if they if they'd had someone play nice harp music, I would have been fine. <laughs> But music makes a difference. And uh, so we're going to look at the divide over, over music. Salvation, what is it? Calvinism, Arminianism. Um, can you lose salvation after you're genuinely born from above? Can you lose it? Will you always keep it? There's a division uh, theologically about that. And we'll address that. Place of Israel, tongues, uh, fellowship with God, and music. Now, uh, this is uh, my attempt to sketch what I call the theological divides mountain. The theological divides mountain. And let me say this. Uh, I want you to see my heart. There are some things I would never divide something I would never divide over. I'm not a divisive person. But the servant is not above his master. And as I said just a moment ago, Jesus said, I am come to set a, a household into a division. And so I'm not better than Jesus. And if Jesus, if Jesus is the cause of some division, then I have to realize I'm, I'm not near as good as Jesus. And I'm going to have to make some decisions sometime to go in a, in a direction that will put at least some, some division between myself and others. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Up here, uh, different opinions on non-essentials. Different opinions on non-essentials. That's just a small, just a small cleavage. Just a small division. I, I still have fellowship with some that I disagree with on non-essentials. Uh, and especially within the nuclear family. Within the nuclear family. The next step of uh, dividing two, you see it gets wider. The division gets wider, which means you will spend less time with them. You will wish it would be otherwise, but the differences are getting wider, so you're going to spend less time. This would be different opinions on non-essentials within the local church. Now again, I would not divide from any of our other members on non-essentials. Uh, I just would not divide from any of our members on non-essentials. The third level, you see this, the division is getting bigger. Uh, this is different opinions among non-ecumenical Baptists about such things as close or closed Lord's Supper. Again, I would not divide. Uh, Jane and I attended a Baptist church in West Florida, and it was uh, closed, closed communion, closed communion. That means you had to be a member of that local assembly before you could take part in the Lord's Supper. Now, I, I was introduced to that when I was about 16. I went to a Plymouth Brethren Assembly, a very small group, very small group, and they practiced closed Lord's Supper, and only those who were members of that local assembly could share with them in the Lord's Supper. So the rest of us, maybe one or two of us, we sat at the back. And this good, independent, independent, uh, fundamental Baptist church in West Florida, they also practice closed communion. You're, you're not, if you're not a member of that church, and so I asked the pastor, I asked the pastor, they, they, they announced it for a Tuesday night. And most, most closed communion Baptist churches will announce it for a service other than Wednesday or Sunday. And they do that deliberately so non-members never hear about it. All right? Uh, the first Baptist church Jane and I attended after we, 
after we left the Armenian, the Armenian group, uh, was that kind of church as well. And they would, they would have the Lord's Supper before the announced Sunday evening service. If the evening service was seven, then they would have their Lord's Supper at six, so that non-members would not come. So uh, I, would, I would never uh, divide from another pastor uh, over close, uh, close communion says you need to be sure you're born again and you need to be baptized by immersion. And that's what Dyer Baptist Church practices. We practice close Lord's Supper. So if a, a born again, immersed, immersed Baptist comes from another uh, Baptist church, he or she may take Lord's Supper with us. That's close communion. But closed is no, you have to be on the roll of that particular church. And uh, so when I was a boy at the Plymouth Brethren Assembly, I just sat at the back and they passed around the uh, fruit of the vine and the bread and I didn't take. And then a couple summers ago, or rather a couple winters ago in West Florida, I said to the pastor, I phoned him before, I said, I, I noticed that you announced uh, Lord's Supper for, for Tuesday night, not Wednesday or Lord's Day. Uh, should I assume that you practice closed Lord's Supper? He said, yes, we, we practice close Lord's Supper as most of the churches in their particular independent Baptist fellowship do. I said, I understand that, there is no problem, but may Jane and I still come to observe and sit at the back. He said, you're most welcome to come and observe and sit at the back. I kept going there. I would never split over a thing like that. That's what I mean by a uh, uh, something that I would not call an essential. Uh, there, they're small c conservative Baptists, and I'm not going to separate over one little thing like that. Well, we move further down. Now, here, section number four. And again, keep reminding the division gets further and wider the more you go down. Number four is different doctrinal views between those who may agree on inerrancy, virgin birth, and deity but disagree on major emphasis like Calvinism. Uh, when you get to number four, I put some division. I could never be a member of Five Point Calvinist Church that says some people are, are predestinated before they're ever born to go to hell. I'm not sure we're going to get that far today. I could never be a member uh, of a Five Point Calvinist Church. Uh, we, have, we have a number of them in the academy. They're welcome. Um, they're welcome, but I could never be, and they would never want to be a member here. You see, it, it cuts both. That's getting, that's getting much closer to major doctrine, major doctrine. Uh, how, how are you going to have some members who believe that you're chosen before you're born to go to hell, and, and other members who believe that your own free will has something to do with it? You can't have that under the same roof. You would have a constantly splitting church. You just gotta lay out your doctrine in the beginning and say, look, you'll be happier at another church because we don't believe that some people are chosen before they're born to go to hell. So uh, I do, I do have a, a degree of, of uh, separation over that. It's not the same as the Lord's Supper being uh, closed or closed. And then I alluded to this one earlier. Oh yes. Uh, by the time you get to uh, five, uh, absolutely, division, uh, separation, because they're denying essentials of the Bible, such as the need for the blood of Jesus, such as the, the virgin birth and the return of our Lord. Uh, so I would never, I would never be a member of a church with a pastor didn't believe that the Bible is true and inspired. I would never be a member of a church where the pastor made fun of the blood. I pastored in the county up in Ontario where the, well, yes, the younger Mennonite, the younger Mennonite pastors came back from Goshen Seminary. And it's rather ironic that now I live about two hours from Goshen. But way up there in Ontario, Canada, the, uh, the, the new fresh crop of Young Mennonite preachers were coming back from Goshen Seminary, and they 
came back to Waterloo County, went into the Mennonite churches and said, we'll be getting a new hymn book. We'll be getting a new hymn book, and our new hymn book will not have any more hymns with that butcher shop religion, all those hymns about the blood. They're editing a new hymn book, and the new hymn book will have no hymns about the blood. That's, that's his butcher shop, and that's archaic. Uh, I would never, ever, ever be a member of that kind of church. I would separate. I would divide. So you see, uh, we divide over some things, other things we don't divide over. We pray for love and grace and carry on. But the thing is to pray for wisdom as you go along. Okay? What do we separate over? What do we divide over? Constant prayer for wisdom and discretion. All right. All right. Here we are. We're over here. We're over here. A Calvinism, five point Calvinism, uh, that's right over here. Five point Calvinism, the Reformed churches. There are a lot of them around here. Uh, some of them more conservative than others. Uh, Some five-point Calvinists are very conservative in their behavior. Others say they're five-point Calvinists, and they're pretty loose. They're pretty loose in their behavior. You see, a five-point Calvinist says that if you're elected, if you're elected or you're chosen before you're ever born, you're in, and there's nothing you can do that will get you out of salvation. So it can tend. It doesn't have to, but it can tend toward loose living. All right? Hey, if I'm in and I was baptized as an infant, if they took me to a font, took me to a font, and uh, if the Reformed pastor uh, sprinkled some water on my forehead, and I'm in, and I was baptized as a baby in the covenant, and nothing can get me out, why not? Why not drink booze? Why not do pornography? if I'm chosen before I'm born. So, now I repeat, some, some Calvinists, some Reformed people are very conservative and they would never use their, their so-called election or being chosen before they're born as an excuse to live loose. But on the other hand, some use their pre-birth choice as an excuse to live like they please. All right. Uh, all imbalanced emphases depend on a selective use of scripture. I, I know you can't read it. I'll say it again, then you say it with me. All imbalanced emphases depend on a selective use of scripture. Let's try it together. All imbalanced emphases depend on a selective use of scripture. I will take this verse and I will harp on it and harp and harp and harp, but I will never consider this verse. The Bible is a very balanced book. And when you get when you get an extreme off either end of the dock, it's because somebody is putting an overemphasis on one verse and conveniently overlooking another verse. And oh my, I pray every day for balance. For balance in my life, my doc, and I don't claim I've arrived at perfect balance. But that's my goal. Our Lord Jesus came full of grace and truth. All right, he, he, he was gracious, but he was also a conservative when it came to holiness. So, uh, all, all uh, imbalanced emphases, and both of these are imbalanced. Both Calvinism and Arminianism are imbalanced. And we're going to present a third option next week. And it's exciting, it's exciting. I had never heard about it till about 10 years ago. I can't even get the profs in uh, some Bible college to discuss it. It's like they've never heard of the man who lived at the time of these two. He lived at the time of these two. And he reacted against five-point Calvinism. And he, he, couldn't, he couldn't go all the way to Arminianism. And he's right there balanced. Uh, I, I can hardly get 
any independent Baptist to talk about it. It's just like they've never heard of the man. Why should he be left in obscurity when he does offer an option? Uh, and it was born in the crucible of this battle. This battle. And he felt pulled either this way or this way. And he studied and studied and studied. And he said, I don't think either extreme is what the Bible is teaching. We'll get to that. Uh, Five-point Calvinists believe in total inability, total inability or total depravity. Uh, that basically, practically boils down to there's nothing in you, not, not even a choice, not even a choice. You're either chosen to heaven before, before the creation or you're chosen to hell. And if you're chosen to hell, you are totally unable to do anything to save you, so just shut up and go on to hell. That's exactly, uh, that's, now they're, they're not quite that blunt, but that, that is the essence of a five-point Calvinism. Total inability. You, you don't even have the ability to say, out of my bondage, sorrow and night, Jesus I come, Jesus I come to. You don't even have the ability to say, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. You don't even have the ability to come if you've been chosen before the creation to be damned to hell. You don't even have the ability to come. That's what they mean by total inability, unconditional election. That's a uh, corollary. Corollary. Five-point Calvinists put a great deal of emphasis on logic. And once you buy into a couple of these five points, once you buy into a couple of them, you're on a logical road, and you're probably going to buy them all. You're probably going to buy them all. They, they go strong on logic. You have to be able to figure it out. So they say, accept this premise, accept this premise and this premise, and you'll be in for the, for the rest of the five. That's how it works. And they're very intellectually oriented people. They really put a, a big emphasis on the mind. Total inability, unconditional election, limited atonement. They say, Jesus it did not die for everybody oh, since I was a child. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that what? Whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. No, they, they say whosoever only means the elect. It doesn't mean whosoever. Uh, they define they define terms to fit their logical logical sense. It's limited atonement. Jesus did not die uh, for everybody in Africa. He didn't die for everybody in Indiana. He only died for the ones who were chosen before the foundation of the earth to go to heaven. Limited atonement. Then irresistible grace. Irresistible grace is if you've been elected. Before the foundation of the earth, uh, you're in. You may come kicking and screaming. You may not even want to be in. But uh, God's grace, if you were elected uh, before you were born, before the earth uh, was created, it, it's irresistible grace. You're coming. You're coming no matter what. Irresistible grace. But the Bible says, ye have resisted. It's right. Shake your concordance. Ye have resisted. God says that individuals can resist God. Now, we went through all the references on this when we did it the first time. All right, perseverance of the, perseverance of the saint. If you were elected uh, before creation, uh, no matter what, you will persevere. Uh, if you're in, you're in. Uh, if you're in, you'll hold on. You may have difficult times, but if you're elected, you're in. You'll persevere. You'll persevere, and you're in. All right? Now, we believe, <laughs> we believe part of that. All right? We believe part of that. But we don't believe it. Uh, dependent upon or determined by the election, all right? We believe if we're born from above, God's spirit is within us, and God's spirit produces holiness, and we believe that we will 
person here, but it's not because of election. It's not an arbitrary thing. It's because, as John said, we have God's seed. We have God's seed in us. And God's seed cannot habitually live in sin. All right? So it, it, it sounds similar, but the reasoning is different. All right. I think it's 11 minutes still. And that means, well, all right. Well, all right. Uh, next week, we'll just review these first three, and then we'll be caught up. <laughs> so we did about six weeks in 45 minutes. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for being, uh, tell your friends, uh, ask your friends. Now, if they're going to another 10 o'clock class, that's fine. But if they're not going, if they're not coming at 10 o'clock, phone them and invite them to come to the uh, theological device class if they're not already in another class. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate you being here.